My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Mr. Chris Martinson himself. Chris, for those who have been living under a rock and don't know your background, introduce yourself. Who are you? What have you done throughout your career? What are you doing currently? Well, thank you. Hey, Michael, great to be back with you here today and all your listeners and some of mine too. I think a few have trickled over. So I'm Chris Martinson. I have a PhD in pathology from Duke University. I was a scientist for a while. I Decided to go off into the world of business, got an MBA, worked in corporate finance, ooh, three years at Pfizer, a little company some people have heard of. Was not a good fit uh, for me, went off and um, was working as a strategic consultant for a period of time. And then I read this book called Creature from Jekyll Island, and I said, this can't be true. Money is not created that way. I would know if it was. And I started investigating and created something called The Crash Course, which I put out as a video series on my blog back in the day, 2008. And that became my mission in life, to tell people about what's going on in the world, provide some common sense, connect some dots. And fortunately, I'm very fortunate, mission became money and and it became my livelihood. So for the past, I guess, 14 years now, I've been running an online community called Peak Prosperity. Great group of people. We're dedicated to being resilient. I think everybody ought to be thinking about how they're resilient or how they're not in fixing that. And for me, that means many different things, but financial capital is very important. Your emotional capital, very important, et cetera. So so we don't take a a fear-based approach very much. It's just pragmatic, common sense. Here's some data. You don't have to like it, but you do have to respond to it. That's what we do. I think most people obviously want to believe that their besties are ahead of them. When you say peak prosperity, of course, my mind goes to, well, it's not going to be the case. (laughs) Maybe explain just why you use that term and what does that exactly refer to? Well, double entendre, right? We all want to be in peak financial condition or peak, you know, uh, health. That sounds good, but there's also the sense that maybe there's you're at the peak and it goes down from there. That was actually, you know, I, I meant both things. I think we can achieve a better peak condition for ourselves, but as well, we're we're kind of past peak. And and once you understand the relationship between energy and prosperity, and Germany's about to learn this good and hard, right? Once you understand that relationship and then you understand where we really are in the energy story, it's, it's hard to make a case for how we're going to have higher, broad, broader living standards across the world. That sounds, you know, not positive, but actually I think it is a positive because we get back to things that really matter and we can begin to, you know, have lives that have a lot of meaning and purpose in them. But make no mistake, where we are in this energy story, Michael, I am shocked how few people are paying attention to what I consider to be the most important story of them all. All right, so so let's get into that. I know you want to talk about uh, the EIA, and obviously there's a lot of news and and horrible things going on in the Middle East, uh, which could be impacting oil, but uh, you can argue maybe hasn't quite just yet. First of all, are we, what does peak energy actually mean? It? And, and draw that link between you know, energy abundance and economic prosperity. I'd be glad to. I, I mean, some of this is just really easy, right, to understand, which is that, Let's say I, I need a new lithium battery component for this fancy widget I'm building. It has to come from China. So if you think through that whole chain, starting from some brine salts in the Atacama Desert in South America, where the, the lithium is, all the way on through to the fashioning and the shipping and the transporting of this battery, if you look at it through the energy lens, you put your energy goggles on, you'll see there's just massive quantities of energy for that to happen. And there could be all this wonderful, beautiful economic activity and, and prosperity that comes from that. But at the end of the day, if we didn't have the energy to prosecute that, make let all those things happen, then it wouldn't have happened. So that's why I don't just say, you know, many people look at commodities and say, well, you know, you got grain, softs, you know, fibers, uh, this, that, coal, and oil. It's not, no, no, oil is the master resource. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't have the grains nearly in the same quantities. You wouldn't really have copper, all the rest of them. So it's the master resource, all capital letters. And so I really look at where we are in that larger oil story. And here's where it has to get just a little bit more subtle. We have to understand something called net energy. So oil is great, but the whether we have a million barrels or a hundred million or even a billion barrel coming out of the ground, That doesn't matter. What matters is how many barrels did it take us to get those barrels out of the ground? And the surplus, what's left over from that simple economic transaction, simple accounting transaction is is what we run all of society on, right? My whole business runs on spare energy because thankfully other people are very busy out there finding energy, 
at a profit, an energy profit, and then they can release that surplus into the world. And that's how my life is what it is. That's where our prosperity comes from. So, you know, we could make a simple thought experiment, which is let's imagine that, you know, you're on a rocky island. There's just rocks, you know, and that's all you got. If you don't have any energy you can use on that island, you're you're out of business pretty quick as an organism, right? Food is a form of energy, you know, oil could be, et cetera. The primary wealth of any nation is always related to what it has in terms of resources. And at the core of that is its access to energy resources. You you have to have it, period. It's the beginning of the, the whole story. So when we look at that, now we have to ask the question, well, okay, how much energy is out there? How much oil is out there? How much natural gas, all that? And we're at this part of this story where, look, 80% of all the surplus energy that's used in the world comes from fossil fuels, 80% minimum. And that's been true for decades. It hasn't budged despite everything you've read about wind is cheaper than coal now and solar is coming on 50% a year and all that stuff. When you run the charts, you ask the question, how much energy is the world using? 80% comes from fossil fuels. But again, the part we care about is, well, how much surplus energy comes from that? And this is where, in particular for oil, it's a really fascinating story. And it's just the conventional oil we got out once upon a time. That was the amazing stuff. That was the bomb, right? Drill a thousand feet down. You know, you get those gushers, exploding wells, all that pressure. It's exciting. That stuff was high net energy. I mean, 50 to 100 to 1, even greater returns. Hugely valuable. And we built a whole economy around that concept. Well, now you fast forward, we're still finding oil, but ah, now it's kind of like we have to pressure wash it off of sand up in the tar sands up in Canada. We've got the Orinoco belt down in Venezuela. We literally have to almost spatula it out of the ground. We've got the shale oil. All of these things, I'm not saying don't do them, but we have to understand these things do not have the same net energy returns and therefore they do not have the same economic force behind them to support all the other things that our economies do. So that's where we're at in this story. And I know China's fully, they're they're like eyes right on it. They get it. They're paying attention. But our own energy information agency here in the US is busy gaslighting us around all this stuff. And and it's very frustrating because it's really important that we get this concept right. So my mind goes to sort of a Malthusian way of thinking about oil in the sense that, you know, the argument that it's getting harder to get the quality oil and that the net energy is not as high as it used to be, you know, how does technology factor into that? Because, you know, presumably as AI becomes more of a thing and technology keeps on permeating every industry, it might be not as ideal in the way that oil comes out of the ground because it, where how it's, you know, as you kind of explained, it extracted. But presumably technology can help counter some of that. It can to a point. Right. I mean, geology is what it is. There's only so much oil in the rock and it's under certain pressures and it's of a certain grade. And there's all these complexities that it quickly sort of factor in. And again, this story is not one of, hey, we run out. Right. I can make a case for how we're going to be getting oil out of the ground in the year 2100. The problem isn't that per se. The problem is this. We have a financial system that since around, well, I'll put a date on it, August 15th, 1971 has been busy compounding its debts at roughly twice the rate of the underlying economy. And the economy, we'll call that GDP in this case, the economy itself, Michael, is, I can show you a chart. It's the most robust chart I have in all of my economic charts. And I got a lot of them. And this one just simply plots, hey, how much GDP has the world had over time? We can start this back in the 70s. That's where the data goes. How much economy has the world had across one axis? That's in trillions. GDP across the globe. And the other axis would be, well, how much oil is it burning? Right. And this chart has, it's a dead flat line relationship. There's no, hey, technology has allowed us to really, you know, get way more efficient on this whole story. There's no flattening of this curve, this line where, where we could say we're doing more with less. We've decoupled is the, the famous term that sort of has disappeared from the lexicon, but they used to say that, right? We've decoupled. We're now getting more from less. You can only show decoupling at the micro scale, like like a country, like Ireland looks like it's hugely decoupled from the energy story because it has this massive GDP growth without a corresponding increase in energy. But that's mostly because of the tax haven stuff and companies put their profits over there and, and their revenues and uh, they move it there. But 
we have to look at this on a global basis to not hide the fact that little countries are offshoring their energy intensive industries, mostly to China. So when you put it on a global basis, Michael, and you ask the question, how much economic growth and how much oil consumption are we having? It's a dead flat. It's a, it's a very linear relationship. No, hardly any wiggles in that line for 60 years now. So what do we do with that data? To me, I just say, okay, until I have different data, the answer is more economic activity requires or commands the use of more oil. Great. That's, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because when, you know, what's a unit of economic activity? I get in my car, I, I go to the store, I buy something. You can see where all the oil is in that story, right? It's in the car, it's embodied in the building of the car, the driving of it, obviously. But then the things I buy might be made out of oil directly or got there on a truck that was using oil. It's very easy to to understand why there's a good tight relationship between oil use and economic growth. So, okay, great. So if we have the economies dependent on oil, but we're growing debts at twice the rate of the economy, we have an implicit and also I would dare I say it, an explicit assumption baked into that, which is in the debt markets, which is, oh, well, we're always going to have an economy in the future that can pay these things off. Well, is that true? If so, the implicit and I dare say explicit assumption is we're making the, the, the assumption that the future economy is going to be bigger. It's going to use a lot more oil. Okay. Now you got to wander with me over to the oil story and I can show you all the countries and basins that are now past peak and they just are. And unless they find shale like the U.S. did, technology or not, there's only so much geology that any one area has or can afford, you know, to, to prosecute. And that's where the story gets a little bit more interesting. And so, yeah, there's more shale basins out there. Uh, I'm particularly, I think Argentina's, you know, going to be one of the hot spots with the Vaca Muerta. It's beautiful. But globally, I can't make a strong case that we're going to be able to have more and more oil going forward. And I'm not alone. JP Morgan, their analyst just came out with a chart that I think came out a couple, maybe a month or two ago, where they were just looking at the difference there between supplies and demand. And they see a, a persistent, if not permanent gap between what the supplies need to be and what they're projecting demand to be starting about mm, 2025. And this is global. And it just persists to, to a very sizable shortfall by 2030, which is where their chart ends. So this is a big deal because our debt markets, as you know, they're either happily expanding or they're busy threatening to collapse. Like they don't have an intermediate state, like they're, they're growing or they're not. And, and so that's the actual tension that's in the air right now. And there's no such thing as a soft landing for debt. No. I think it's kind of the point. <laughs> no, for the economy, but not for debt. Okay, but, but hold on. Okay, now, but the other word you, you used there was access. Okay, so I think this is where it does get to be nuanced because it is ultimately about access to oil. Because like you said, it's not like you're not going to, you're going to run out of oil. The, the peak oil argument, I think, even goes back to the 60s or 70s and all those projections ended up being very wrong. But it is ultimately about access. In the U.S., obviously, we are more isolated than ever before from oil shocks, you can argue, just because of the shale revolution and all this stuff. But how do you think about access to uh, oil, to energy, in the context of geopolitical dynamics we're seeing now? It's everything. So there's really, let me be completely honest, there's really only one plum left on the tree, and that's the Middle East. We had Iraq, which had 20 plus years of sanctions, so it really poorly prosecuted its conventional oil fields. It's got amazing conventional oil resources left. Same for Iran, same sort of a story. Those sanctions and the geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and those two countries led to really poor utilization, we'll say, of their oil story. So, okay, fine. Now let's fast forward and I'll tell you the most shocking development geopolitically probably of my adult lifetime was when last February, when I open up the paper and I find out that China somehow brokered a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Right. The Sunnis and the Shias are like, what? When did this happen? And when you read China's energy policy, you understand exactly what happened. They know exactly the nature of that plum and they are working very hard to secure their own access to it. China is by far the number one importer of oil. And of course, your imports are what you really care about if you're a nation that is import dependent. And boy, are they. China produces rough numbers here around four million barrels a day and they're burning consuming around 16, 17 million barrels a day right now. This is enormous. 
But I could say same thing for all of Southeast Asia and in India. If we put them in one bucket, right? So that's Malaysia, India, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Australia, all of them. Their production is right around 3 million barrels a day, give or take. And their consumption is up around 13 million barrels a day. So they have a 10 million barrel day shortfall. There's only two countries that are at the top of this list in terms of having net exports. And that's Saudi Arabia and Russia. Both of those are now currently not on, you know, the top of the fa most favored list with the United States. And that's the geopolitical tension that's shaping up. And that's how we have to understand everything that's unfolding in the Middle East right now. All right. So I started the conversation saying I need you to re-hinge me, if that's an actual term, right? Because I felt unhinged watching Powell kind of rage tweeted mm -hmm. like I usually do. And, you know, he, he in the discussion around what's going on with long duration yields, one of the things that Powell said is, well, you know, maybe... One of the theories is because we're in a world now where you're more likely to have supply shocks in commodities and oil, and that the bond market, the treasury side, given time, given the duration aspect, is trying to price in the possibility of that type of a world that we're now in, right? Just a world where you constantly have these kind of tail shocks in commodities and in particular oil. This is where I think this ties nicely into the name of the space, the un an unavoidable financial crisis. Now, some people will say, that sounds like perma bear talk, but let's make the link between oil shocks and the financial system with that debt part of the discussion. Absolutely. So remember, I think it was last year sometime this year, five, six months ago, I remember there was a Senate hearing and Cynthia Loomis out of Wyoming was asking Powell about the fiscal part of the thing. He's only supposed to be a monetary guy, but she couldn't help herself. She said, hey, is the federal government debt, you know, a problem? And he said, well, no, not the amount of debt, but, you know, the part that is unsustainable, paraphrasing badly here, he said, is that there's this gap between the growth in the debt and the underlying economy. And that in the long run is unsustainable. That lap sparks direct quote. I remember him saying that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, we should have more conversations about that because it's unsustainable, right? Herb Stein said anything that's unsustainable will stop, right? So we know we're on this collision course where we've been doing something that's really dumb, which is we're growing federal debt faster than the underlying economy. Well, that was then. But, you know, I just pulled these numbers today because, you know, some people had noted that U.S. federal debt had like skyrocketed a ton, like 600 billion over the last month. Right. So it caught a, a few eyeballs. So I, I, I added it up. I pulled the numbers from debt to the penny off of the Treasury site. And so it's been 134 days since the debt ceiling has been raised. And in those 134 days, Michael, the in debt has increased by 1.8 trillion. So what? 134 days. So if we annualize that, and I, we won't, I mean, it has to back off, but that's 4.9 trillion yearly run rate over the last 134 days, right? It's, it's basically, we're increasing the debt at about $13.6 billion a day. And that's ever since 2020, there's a whole new slope to government debt. Let's just not take, you know, the last 134 days. Maybe that's just we're playing some catch up because, you know, we had a debt ceiling debate for so long, crisis for so long. But even still, over the last 3.3 years, it's a yearly run rate of $2.2 .2 trillion of deficit spending, whereas the prior 10 years to that, it had been a yearly run rate of about half that. So it's like this DC's got this new permanent, oh, we'll just run $2 trillion deficits now. So I think Powell needs to include that, that we have extra surplus supply. That's, you know, what's a bond price? Well, it's the opposite of the bond yield, right? It's just a seesaw. So with yields going up, it means we have more people selling. Who's selling? Well, the federal government, 13 billion a day, right? As well, we have Japan selling because they've got their own issues and they've got to try and defend the yen. So they're selling off their sovereign. China's been dishoarding U.S. treasuries, you know, um, so is Saudi Arabia. So all, there's a lot of pressures to sell these things, which, which go beyond just the tail shocks that we might see in oil. But I think that's got to be a very realistic risk, as well as the fact that there's more sellers than buyers right now. Yeah, and I think the point is that if we're in this, in this world where the, the bond market has to factor in these tail supply shocks from oil, that makes the funding of government debt, which is, to your point, on the slope, you know, just even more accelerated, even more problematic, right? I mean, this is where sort of the, the mistakes of underinvestment over the last decade in oil now meet the reality of politicians that can't possibly step away from how much debt they're putting into the system. Yeah, and I got to be honest here. I, I'm not just a little bit dismissive. I am highly contemptuous of 
what's happened in the last set of years around oil policy. So Biden, Team Biden, I don't know who's actually running the show there, but whoever it is, they it's have Biden. been. It's not, it's not Biden. Just, yeah, you know, we know that. Uh, listen, you just watch five seconds of video of the guy. You, you know, that's obvious. But whoever's been running it has decided for the first time in my lifetime to day trade the price of oil for political purpose. So we dishoarded the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, to drive the price down. Well, that's great. Drove the price down. That I'm sure that it's a political advantage that, that they felt good about. But what did it do? Well, we didn't get the investment of, you know, that, that tamped down some investment in oil because we should have had higher prices to send the right signals and you let the free markets work and then they do what they do. So you've mentioned an important point here. We're not just missing a year or two of, in, of underinvestment in oil. We're closing in on nine years of underinvestment in oil and it's in the trillions right now. And if suddenly we wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, supply shortfalls, let's get this puppy going. You don't just suddenly, you know, put a trillion dollars into the Gulf of Mexico and oil comes out next Tuesday. It's just not how it works. We've lost appropriate skilled labor. The, mach the machines themselves have rusted away. We may not even have enough uh, offshore oil platforms at this point. You know, da -da -da. There's a, there's a, it's complex, right? But they've been playing as if they can just sort of like distort reality and somehow this all works out. All right. So we've disordered the SPR. Mostly it has two grades, um, medium, sour, and light. We got rid of all the medium sour because that's what our refineries like. What's left is mostly light. We don't have as much use for that. That's the stuff we're exporting because it's, you know, it's a lot of naphtha and gasoline and it's not quite what we want. At any rate, so here we are. And I think to close this around, we've seen now for the first time, Iran just recently, I think yesterday, put out the idea that maybe Israel ought to be punished because of their treatment of Gaza Strip. So they're going to, they said, we propose, propose a, an export ban or an embargo on oil going to Israel. Small country in the scheme of things from that standpoint. But that was the first time we heard Arab nations use the word embargo a long time, right? If that happens, if for whatever reason, if Lindsey Graham, the odious, horrifyingly terrible states, you know, spokesperson got his way and we actually did bomb the refineries of Iran, there's nothing to stop then Iran from, well, first of all, their oil exports go to zero and that's important missing um, supply from the world. But then they might mine the Strait of Hormuz. If they do that, pick a number. Is oil 300 a barrel or is it 500? I mean, pick a number, right? And it, it would, that would send a shock that if we tie this all the way back, I promise you I'm going somewhere, Michael. The, the, this is an uncontrollable event that the Fed can't control. There's no combination of cutting rates, raising rates, putting money in the, no, nothing solves that. That is a supply shock that leads to an inflationary shock that the Fed can't do anything about except stick to its knitting and try and keep inflation under control so it doesn't spiral out of control. That's the tail risk. Lizzie Graham is also a fucking idiot. <laughs> I'm with you on that. All right, let's go to, by the way, I, I'm neither, I mean, I, I guess I'm more, myself more of an independent. I think they're all fucking idiots. That's a whole different, I think we can all agree that every single politician is a fucking idiot. Oh, great questions, Prometheus. Good to meet you too. Well, well the petrodollar is still mostly what's being used. There, there has been, we've seen some settlement in Yuan. There is some attempted settlement in ru rupees. There's been some going on. And, but that's a process, going to be a process to get the petrodollar unwound. Now, this is a, also a really big deal. This is a huge changing of the guard, as it were. So I mentioned August 15th, 1971. That was the abandonment of Bretton Woods II. That was where the gold standard got temporarily suspended by Nixon. Here we are still temporarily suspended. And that would have really gone off the rails very quickly if Kissinger hadn't stepped in and enshrined by 1973 this whole thing of the petrodollar, which is genius. You know, the dollars are no longer backed by gold, but they were backed by the U.S. military and the fact that you had to have them to buy oil. That was extraordinary demand for dollars out there. It required everybody who had to import oil to run a positive trade surplus, either directly or indirectly with the U.S., it was an exorbitant privilege, all of that. That is now coming to an end. And we have seen, as you hinted there, a couple of times when countries have attempted to abandon the dollar as a petrodollar, it hasn't gone well. That was Iraq back in the day, then Iran as well. They also tried to set up an oil bourse and they got squished. But now it's China, the BRICS, Russia is a key leader of that. So now we're seeing this changing of the guard if that happens. What, you know, if we see the abandonment of the dollar, the petrodollar, 
Well, this is where we have to understand the amount of potential energy in the system. There's not just a few of these petrodollars offshore. There's close to $10 trillion of them just parked out there. And they're, what happens if people no longer need petrodollars, don't want them? Well, you know, Peru doesn't need dollars to buy oil from Saudi Arabia anymore for whatever reason. Now it needs yuan. Then it has to run a positive trade balance with China eventually to make this all balance out. So everything changes. This is all up for grabs. And this is an extraordinary thing that's unfolding, which again is why watching China somehow co-opt the United States out of that kingdom of Saudi Arabia loop back there has been one of the most stunning things I've seen. And that tells me everything I need to know about where this is all going over the next 10 years or so. And it's going to be this, who has access to the oil? That's going to be the key thing. Because again, if you are an oil importing nation, your prosperity depends on it. You have to have it. Hey, there's a little fat you can trim off of that, that, you know, body a little bit, but for the most part, you really need it to conduct your business. And so then we're going to see who's really standing where. And by the way, uh, you know, I mentioned the gaslighting all the way back when from the EIA here in the U.S. Remember like during COVID, suddenly the CDC couldn't tell the difference between having a case of COVID versus having an infection. Well, I know. Well, there's, there's that. All of a sudden they say, look at all these cases. And like, no, that's something you detected with a 40 cycle threshold PCR test. It's not a case is when somebody shows up at the hospital or a doctor. That's what it used to be. Suddenly they lost the ability, right? Well, the EIA has lost the ability to understand what petroleum is. To me, that's oil. Nah, they're throwing in natural gas liquids and they're throwing in all, they throw in all this stuff that isn't oil. And just recently, I was, you know, we just announced, oh, you know, all time brand new high of petroleum production in the US. And I have to go in and I have to like untangle this and look at it. No, that's not true. They just suddenly had to make an accounting shift because they had a bunch of inventory they didn't know what to do with. So they called it production but it's really natural gas liquids. It's mostly butane and ethane and they call it petroleum and it, it's not what it is at all. And again, it's like, can we, wait a minute, why can't we keep this separate? Like this is what, this is all you do. You can multi-billion dollar agency with a bunch of spreadsheets, just add it up properly. Tell us what it is separate. And they're fudging it and putting it all in one spot where you have to spend a lot of time to try and unravel it. And I think that's by design. And it's the same gaslighting and its purpose is to make it seem like we're stronger than we are. Well, if you actually go through the whole rigmarole and you find the right analysts and you look at it, you find out that all this oil exporting the United States has been doing has mostly been natural gas liquids. That's fine. You know, we want to sell propane to China and Japan. That's great. But it's not the same thing as saying we're an oil powerhouse who has so much oil we're exporting it. We're exporting the stuff we, we literally don't know how to use. We have more butane and propane than we know what to do with. So we export it. Great. I'm not complaining about that. What I complain about is that the United States still is a net crude oil importer by a big margin. And we're a net exporter of this other stuff. And they're not the same. They're not the same at all. It's, it's like if somebody said, hey, how much food do you have in your kitchen? I'm like, well, I got a head of lettuce and I got a battery in a drawer. Batteries have energy in them. Uh, this is the same thing. Let me just add it up. <laughs> Tell you how many calories of, of food I have. It's, it, they're totally different. And so this is a time I think we need crystal clear data. It's got to be as, as tight as possible so we can make good decisions. But Team Biden doesn't want us making good decisions right now, right? They've just canceled leases up in Alaska. They've made it really hard. You know, they, they took our last greatest uranium to mix things up a bit. Our last best uranium deposits around the Grand Canyon and, and push those off into a national park status. So hands off that just passed rules to make it really difficult to operate in the Gulf of Mexico and sold the SPR. Like when you put it all together, you know what they say, right? Once is an accident, twice is coincidence, but three times is enemy action. Like they're working hard from my perspective to dismantle our prosperity engine. And I don't have a good answer for that. Just uh, reset the room for the remaining 20 minutes. Everybody, please make sure you follow Chris Martinson here on X. If you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be a podcast under Lead Lag Live on Apple, YouTube, and Spotify. Let's go back to fear mongering. <laughs> going back to the unavoidable financial crisis, because I, I have to tell you, I am not a perma bear, and I know perma bears probably say that, but I really am not. Like, I, I do believe that optimism is what drives progress. But the more I see what's going on with bonds and in particular treasuries, I, I, it's actually now getting to be outright disturbing. Now, 
I will preface this by saying I clearly have been wrong in arguing that treasuries would counter equities because they haven't yet. You have not had the flight to safety trade. And despite all the short interest on treasuries, there's been no motherboard short squeezes yet. I still think it's coming at some point. And the speed with which yields are moving is really shocking. I mean, it, I think it's more shocking than what we saw last year. I, I want to get your take on what's going on in the bond market. I, it's got to be more than oil. It's got to be more than energy. It's got to be more than supply. There's something happening here which seems really, going back to that word unhinged, beyond unhinged in terms of the most important asset in the world. Well, we we know, you and I both know, everybody listening, we all know that if the Federal Reserve and or the other central banks reverse course and begin, you know, quantitative easing and buying these things back, you'll get that short squeeze and more, right? They're not. I, I take, Powell's the first Fed chairman since Greenspan. I have to go back to like, I got to go back before Greenspan to find a, a Federal Reserve chairman I actually believe when he says something. So Powell told us, he said, I'm going to keep raising rates till something breaks. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, I, I don't think that break has happened yet. So what we're seeing still is like, I consider to be amazing complacency in the stock market that, so nothing's really broken there yet. Yeah, it's wobbling down now and stuff, but I mean, not really like, not super broke. But in the bond market, this is getting to a point where I wonder if they're not going to have to intervene. I'm looking at my screen right I, now. How can they so, not? This is, this is, it's like what's happening is very, you talk about mortgage rates, they're going to be hitting nine, 10% in a matter of weeks like this. Yeah. Well, I mean, so Michael, let's think back. In 2019, collectively, there was about $18.5 trillion of global bonds that had a negative yield. So that the story was so broken back then that was $18.5 trillion of, of bets that said, ah, I'd, I'd like to pay Germany for the right to lend it money, you know, and somehow this is going to work out. So all of that's underwater, right? Remember, it was like, 2019, I guess, the 10-year U.S. hit 0.5%, right? Now it's at five-ish, you know, more or less. So there, we, we're all familiar with the 700 billion mark-to-market losses sitting on the bank balance sheets. But the other question is, that ain't the half of it, right? There's pension funds out there, endowments. There's everybody who was holding those bonds and they were all held by somebody. There's not a chance that they all hedged that off. So, because you can't collectively hedge something, you know, like, trying to insure a town where every house, you know, goes up in smoke, right? It just doesn't, insurance is not a concept under that circumstance. So the question still is like, where are these losses and who's holding them? And I'm so, I'm like you, I'm surprised that it's being allowed to run this hard because this is, this could really break something, not, you know, to add to your sense of disease. That's how I see it. Yeah, it was the back, it's not the, it's not the level, it's the speed. I mean, it, it mm-hmm. is. And the, the thing is, it's like, if it's going to permeate at some point into what I keep calling phase two, which is corporate credit spread widening, whenever that corporate credit, sp- uh, credit spread widening takes place, it's going to be very violent. Uh, it, it almost has to be. It's not going to be a gradual type of thing. So it is, it is like a really, I, I keep joking, everybody's fucked, right? As what I constantly say on X. It's like, I am kind of sincere about that. It's, it's, this is a very nasty, nasty setup. It's a good question. There's a lot of nuance in it. So first up, we know that the shale basins themselves are fairly mature. And we know that because Exxon just paid 60 billion for Pioneer, right? That's what happens. You get the consolidation in a mature industry. We know that the breaking it down a little bit, the Bakken, very nice, beautiful field up in North Dakota. It seems to be past its peak. The Eagleford looks like it's past its peak. And and we can go down this. The Permian's really the last great basin sitting out there. And so the analysis is that, that I've seen that makes sense because ultimately shale plays are a question of acreage. It's really pretty simple. How much acreage do you have? How many wells can you put, you know, on a section? And there's your answer to how much, how many more wells can get drilled. Plenty of space left, but it's not forever. And my analysis that I'm sort of sitting on is that 2025 is probably the last year we're going to see growth in the U.S. shale space. And then it bumps along on a plateau for a good long time, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, but sort of bumping along. And it's kind of independent of how much money we throw at it. So I think the shale space is going to be delivering great stuff. There's some good money to be made there. Particularly, uh, I'm very bullish on oil, by the way. So Michael, to to the extent, you know, you're uber bearish, I am too, but not when it comes to oil uh, for me or natural gas. I, I love these things going forward, uranium too. But now, you know, the, the shale stuff, you can ramp it up pretty quickly, but it, it also declines really quickly. Most people don't know this. If for whatever reason, we, ha- we couldn't drill any more wells going forward. Like there's a national policy, that's it. You know, RFK says no more fracking and we're done. 
Within a year, the amount of oil coming out of the shale space declines by 45% in that first year. It's got this ferocious decline rate. So you got to keep this massive drilling program running just to stay you know, flat. So that's one side. The other side, though, is that if we did say, ah, oh, you know, we're going to open up the East Coast. It's never been drilled. We think there's some stuff there off the shelf. We're going to really hit the Gulf of Mexico hard. Maybe California's you know, shelf as well. If we did that, those take five to seven years, even if you said you know exactly where the oil is because of the infrastructure, because of how long it takes to really, you know, infill drill, those fields take five to seven years to get up to speed and doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. Those are kind of like that, the old saw, which says, well, if it takes one woman nine months to make a baby, it should take nine women one month, right? Now it doesn't work that way. There, there are these long lags and in that business. And so that's, that long lag in the offshore stuff is is actually, I think, going to be our biggest difficulty, independent of policy, independent of desire, independent of money. It just takes time. On the point about being very bullish on oil, how are you actually accessing that? Meaning, are you playing with futures? Are you doing stock? It's because, you know, if you have a bear market dislocation, I mean, I, you never know, maybe it ends up playing out like last year where energy stocks, you know, diverge from broader beta and they're actually positive while most other sectors are down. But last year was, I think, very much the exception, not the norm. So how do you actually play the oil thesis? Two ways. Currently, I'm not, you know, fiddling around with futures because that's full contact sport. And I I have my other business keeps me too occupied. So I like some of the large majors. And because I have a registered investment advisory, I I cannot say which ones, but that's just general education. There's some really nice price earnings, you know, PEs on those and, and good dividend yields. I like those. And as well, I'm also in actual individual oil wells themselves. They've got extraordinary tax benefits and tax write-offs, you know, both on the front end and then the back end. So guess what? You know, if the government wants something, they make the tax policy very favorable and they like new houses, they like oil, and they like people creating jobs. So, so all of those have been made fairly tax advantaged. So I do like individual oil wells, obviously a lot riskier on that side of things, but that that's how I'm playing it right now. I, I am curious, are you, if, if you believe as I do that, yeah, at least short term, there's maybe some dislocation risk. Yeah, I know you're a long term investor, obviously, but are, are you doing anything tactical in terms of, you know, having more cash than usual or going into T-bills? I mean, I do believe that this is one of those really nasty environments where you can just get a trap door. So yeah, yeah if you view that in a similar way, right, and obviously the trap door is opening up in, in treasuries here, what do you do about it? Yeah, so. That's a great question. So I'm still tactically, I'm I'm pretty heavy cash right now and I'm waiting. So I have a very, you know, I have my buy list already. You know, you know, it's very hard to catch those falling knives and, you know, when, when it's happening. But I, I know some companies and, and some plays that I'm very interested in. So I, I have that list ready and I'm building cash at this point. But at the same time, I can't be completely out because I think there could be like if we wake up one morning and the Strait of Hormuz gets closed, it's a it's very quick event to what happens to the associated asset prices. So I, I like to, I have got a foot in the water in the pool, as it were, just to be sure about that. And then, you know, I'm pretty much at this stage, I'm really, I think that what's happened here is we've had an over-financialization and it's possible for me to analyze where all of those chips are going to fall. So I'm pretty much of a hard asset guy at this point. I, I like trees and rocks. I like land. I like, I literally like, uh, you know, when forest land comes available near me, she, I, I buy it if I can. So that's really where I've been at. And I'm, you know, I'm, I've been heavy in gold and silver since 2001 and I haven't really done much with it, but it's just sat there. But I, there's not, I keep running this. I'm like, would I sell this? I'm like, no, no, can't make a case for it. Cause I can't admit, I, I don't really, I don't want the dollars more than I want the physical things at this point in time. So I'm getting very tangible about all of this and. As you know, I, you know, I I live on a couple hundred acres in Western Mass and I've got three cows and 40 chickens and gardens. So I'm really hedged in my bets here, Michael. I think it could get bad. It could. It doesn't have to, but I'm a little worried about it. Hey, you said trees and rock and I, of course, am a fan of lumber and gold. So that kind of worked out very <laughs> nicely. But uh, it's being a gold. It is it's interesting. I've been kind of randomly posting just one word, gold, because you know, the last several days you've had some really interesting divergences happening. I've noted many times before that gold is among, you know, sort of the risk-off safe haven place. So you really have only kind of four ways of playing defense, right, that are true diversifiers. Historically, it's gold, it's the dollar, it's the utility sector, and it's supposed to be treasuries. 
which are failing miserably in that sense. But gold is getting um, intriguing here. I, I wonder if the message of gold here is much more important than people realize because it's not, it, it clearly is diverging and it's getting more of the risk off money, it looks like, than, uh, than pretty much anything else. Yeah, I started to get super nervous about my gold holdings when I saw real rates turn positive and then, you know, continue to tick higher. And the reason is, is that there's a very tight association between gold price and the inverse of, of real rates, right? And you're right. There's been a huge divergence over the past several months where gold's just trundling off and we're seeing these two lines diverge from each other, which is unusual. So let me be clear about this. I don't hold gold because I think I'm going to make money at it. I hold gold because I believe it's a monetary asset. Obviously, it's a tier one asset in BIS terms, but it's actual money, as JP Morgan said, and it behaves as a monetary asset. And so I hold gold for its option value for how I suspect it'll behave when, not if, we have this, you know, some sort of global monetary accident. And I think we're going to have that monetary accident because, you know, I'll show you a chart of GDP versus debt. And this is global, or you can look at by EU or in the US, I don't care. These two lines have been growing apart from each other for a really long time. And so there's only two ways to resolve that. One, massive austerity. Two, you print your way out of it. Well, I can't think of a single leader in EU or US terms who's got the stones to actually go out and level with people and tell them that we've been living beyond our means for four decades and it's going to be really painful, but we're going to have to you know, live below our means nobody's going to do that. So they'll either run it till it breaks or they'll try and print their way out of it. Either way, we end up with a monetary crisis. And that's when gold does what it's supposed to do, which is be insurance and give you the option value that's implied in that. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to actually watch uh, from an intermarket perspective. That's now the momentum play. I personally, I've made the argument before, if I'm right that we're still in a bear market, uh, which I have been consistent in that thesis, and as institutional investors start to realize that we never were in a new bull market, they start looking for diversifiers. They start at the margin going into gold, and that creates the self-filling momentum to maybe cause it to finally break all-time highs. I think I think I may end up being right on that sequence, but yeah, who the hell knows? For those, Chris, that want to track more of your thoughts and work, where would you point them to? Well, for sure, you know, I'm at Chris Martinson on Twitter, and uh, I, I post there, but this sort of my, my snarky outlet that helps me feel better about myself in the world, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like... I like to feel the, the concern. Peakprosperity.com is the website. And that's where we have a, as I mentioned before, just a beautiful community of people, very successful folks on average. And so we talk about all of these things. We value free speech and freedom of speech doesn't really happen unless you have freedom of thought. So everything's open to be discussed, very civil discourse. And we are all wrestling with what do we actually do to become more resilient? Because in this day and age, Michael, no decision is a decision. So people are increasingly waking up and saying, gosh, I ought to be prepared. And we help people through that whole process. And that's back at peakprosperity.com. Everybody, please make sure you follow Chris. As I said, he had me on his show not too long ago. And he is one of the good ones. Oh, I certainly appreciate it. Chris, being a part of this, everybody here that joined, and hopefully I will see you all later. Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.